You're listening to Let's Talk Creation with Todd Wood and Paul Garner, the creation show where we learn, grow, and worship. Well, welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Creation with Todd Wood and Paul Garner. I am Paul Garner. And I'm Todd Wood. Uh, Don't forget to check out our website, letstalkcreation.org. Like and share our episodes uh, and subscribe on whatever podcast platform you're listening to us on or on the YouTube channel, of course. Uh, We're grateful to uh, all those who've subscribed. We like to see our audience grow and uh, welcome, particularly if you're a new uh, listener or viewer. And uh, and welcome, of course, if you're a a regular who's been with us for a while. Uh, It's very good to have you all. Uh, Now, in this episode uh, today, I have a very special guest to introduce to you all, and uh, it's my Uh, co-host, Dr. Todd Wood. (laughs) (laughs) Hello. So, (laughs) yeah, so so kidding kidding aside, um, Todd, uh, you have some great stuff that you're uh, hopefully going to share with us today. Uh, concerning uh, research that you were presenting at the International Co- uh, Conference on Creationism this year, uh, particularly with regards to human origins. And uh, so, so yeah, so we're looking forward to this. And uh, you had a lot of papers at ICC <laughs> this year. How, how, ma- how many papers did you give? Oh, I, I, don't, I don't even know. Um, okay. <laughs> I, can't, I can't count that high. Uh, don't have that many it, fingers. It was, uh, it was several. Why, why did you do this to yourself, Todd? Why did you submit so many papers? I'm, I'm out of my mind. I don't know. It's it's weird. I, I like going to ICC and presenting. I think I think it's nice because there's uh, people, we're all there, right? We're all there. And we don't really have in the world of creationism, there's no, there's no press corps, right? There's nobody watching our work and releasing articles about it and telling people why it's important and so forth. We're sort of insulated yeah. and very, very insulated. And so um, as part of that, then, you know, you know, how do people know and how do people understand the significance of research articles that are released? And so I've tried to do, you know, little articles with my blog over the years, sort of explaining explaining uh what i've been doing and there will be one you know there's one on my blog for this this work as well so i think it's nice to be able to get together in person at icc and to be able to talk things through and have the opportunity to you know talk about misconceptions because it's easy to misunderstand papers when they're just written out and yeah, so it's nice. So, but it's weird because some years I feel like I've made a lot of important progress and I want to be able to present a lot at ICC. I did that at the 2013 ICC. I think I did, I was on five different papers there. Um, 2018, I did one of my own with a student, so I didn't even present anything. <laughs> and then I was a co-author on another. And then this year... I, I had my hands in five different projects. Actually, I had my hands in several more projects beyond that, but they didn't quite make it to the to the submission stage. So, uh, yeah, but I like it. I just like the format. I think it's a great I think it's a great opportunity for us to to present the work that we're doing. And so I like to participate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a great opportunity. And Today, uh, what we wanted to do is talk about three of your papers in particular. I know you've kind of lost count how many you were <laughs> you were involved in, but we, we, we've got three papers in, in particular in mind here. Uh, they're all on the topic of human origins, uh, human fossils and that, that kind of thing. Uh, and the first one which I wanted to talk about is a paper uh, about essentialism yeah. and the humankind. Now, we ought to begin right there. Uh what on earth is essentialism and what has it got to do with the humankind Todd? right so so this kind of goes back to the 20th century um probably the mid 20th century when a when an evolutionary biologist uh named ernst meyer was um promoting this idea that that evolution was a contrast to what he called essentialism. 
And essentialism for him was a holdover from Greek philosophy. And so his idea was that the essentialists went around and said, okay, every category is defined by certain inalienable traits, right? These these characteristics, if you could find them in a, an, in a creature, then that would identify them as definitively belonging to one category. So they were, they, were, they were necessary in the sense that every member of the category possesses that trait. And they were sufficient in the sense that all you needed to show is I have this trait and you're in. It's kind of like, you know, your photo ID, getting into whatever... Uh, or, or a ticket to get into a concert. If you have a ticket, you can get in. Everybody in the concert has the ticket. Uh, people outside, uh, well, some of them might have tickets and didn't get in yet, but but you get the idea. It's it's this membership badge, right? And, and key to his concept of essentialism was this notion that it couldn't change, right? You cannot have a situation where the essential characteristics could be lost, or the essential characteristics could be gained. It's just totally inviolable. You can't change. So this is kind of a myth because no one ever really practiced classification in that way. Um, Even the ancient Greeks understood that things can change. And so no one was really ever doing essentialist sort of taxonomy. On the other hand, um, you do get the sense, you know, I read through the scripture and I see that that God made animals after their kind. That's, that's Genesis 1. And he made humans in his image, in the image of God, which is a pretty big contrast, right? It's not, it's not a trivial note in the text there. It's pretty obvious that there's something really different about humans. He gives them dominion. He gives them mastery over creation. He puts them into the garden to take care of it. Um, We have a very different role and different function in this creation than just gorillas or chimpanzees. And I think that then seeps into our creation as thinking about all sorts of things, you know. Is it, is it then possible that we can just set out a list of characteristics and say, this is what defines this created kind in a, in a very essentialist fashion, right? And, and it's been common, I think, very common, because it's easy to do to describe human beings in that way, right? We would, you, you put up yeah. a chimpanzee skull, you put up a human skull, and you start pointing out the differences. And it's really easy to do because there's lots of differences. And so my interest there was whether this is, in a sense, scientifically rigorously possible to do this, right? Because when you think about when you think about doing this, you sort of end up with this question of, well, I can see the differences, but do they mean anything? Are they important? Are they really the essential differences? the characteristics that define humanity, that set us apart from all the other animals. Yeah. So how do we, how do we know, in other words, how do we know that these traits are the ones that really matter? Right. Yeah. That's, that's basically what you're saying. It's, right. it's kind of an epistemological problem, right? Um, how do you mm-hmm. know those are important? And if you look at living people and living chimpanzees, it's really obvious, right? <laughs> But if you only have a skeleton, well, the differences are obvious, but how do we know that those differences are really important? That's kind of the question. And it might seem trivial when you're dealing with with, um, living people and living chimpanzees, because you can just look at them and see how they're behaving and see what they do. And you can say, oh, yeah, big difference here. But it's not trivial when you only have a skeleton or at best, a fragmentary partial skeleton from the fossil record that has the attributes of humans, but are different. 
right? They're different in some way. Right. And so that's sort of what I wanted to test. I wanted to say, all right, well, this is a really easy sort of, a, what do you call it? Uh, a very intuitive, very obvious way of dealing with the human fossil record, but does it actually work? And I've never taken it seriously. <laughs> I'll tell you that. So this is the first time I actually sat down and said, all right, let's, let's take this seriously and think through this and do this the best we possibly can and see what happens. Hmm. So what did you do? How, how, how did you go about evaluating this kind of approach? Right. So I took, I took, I took kind of two approaches. Well, maybe three approaches. So the first approach I said, let's, let's pick a characteristic that say creationists at large commonly would say is a uniquely human characteristic that you can see in the skeleton and that has a lot of different features associated with it. And I chose bipedal walking, walking on two legs like human beings do. So you've been to the zoo, you know, chimpanzees, they sort of walk around on all fours. Uh, whereas, whereas we human beings, we walk upright and it's a big deal. You know, the first steps that a person takes, that's kind of a big deal. And moms and dads always want to be there to watch. Um, so yeah, so that was my first, that was my first approach was let's pick out the characteristics that we know are involved in upright walking and then map them onto or or sort of try to see if they're shared by something that everybody in creationism agrees is not human. And for that, I chose um, Australopithecus africanus. Now, that's a mouthful. Uh, I picked it because there's a really there's a really very complete skeleton that's been recently published, a skeleton called Littlefoot. And yeah, Littlefoot is easily the most complete of these creatures that's ever been found. Um, it's probably one of the most complete hominins that's ever been found. It's extremely well preserved. And so I thought, okay, well, here's one single skeleton where I can evaluate these traits and see if this thing has these traits that people assume are uniquely human traits, are essential human traits. So that was... Test number one. And test number two, I took a set of characteristics, 391 characteristics of the skull and the teeth, and I started sort of partitioning them. I would say, all right, well, what's only found in Homo sapiens and never found in chimpanzees or gorillas, right? So what's, what's in modern living humans and not in modern living apes? And so that defined a set of characteristics. And then I tried to see all right, well, what does the fossil record look like when I use those characteristics? Do I find that there's a group of fossils that are clearly grouping with humanity or uh, and a group of fossils that are clearly not, right? So that was that was that was that approach. And then I tried to use those same sets of characteristics with with other methods. I tried using cluster analysis, for example, using just those subsets of characteristics. So, yeah, it was it was a lot of complicated stuff because I was really genuinely interested in figuring out, is this going to be a fruitful pursuit? Could this actually work? Right. So that was my... So what did you find? It didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> okay. <No. clears throat> yeah. Now, it's it's tricky. I want to, I wanna, before we get into what happened, I want to emphasize here, the tricky part about essentialism that makes it sort of untestable in some sense is that anybody who wants to be an essentialist could always say, uh, you, didn't, you didn't test the right characteristics, right? It, it's, it's easy. You picked the wrong, you picked the wrong set. That's, that's a possible response to this. Yeah. And so I have to put that out there. Um, it's, it's possible that I just did it wrong. Even, even with my genuine effort to conscientiously do the best I could possibly do, it's possible that I did it wrong. So with the, with the bipedal characters, the, the characters of walking on two legs, 
the vast majority of them were found in Australopithecus africanus. Uh, and I'm not talking about just, you know, one or two characteristics. I'm talking about from literally from head to toe. I chose characteristics in the toe bones. I ch chose characteristics from the skull, everything in between, um, things that would be associated with the, the, the traits that were necessary to walk upright. And Australopithecus africanus showed most of those traits. Not all of them, but most of them. So there was that. That didn't really work. Now, of course, you might say, well, that's obviously not an essential characteristic. So maybe you should have looked at for an essential characteristic. Maybe you should have worked harder. Granted, again, <laughs> I'll give you that. So that's, that's one issue. And then with the 391 characteristics where I tried to sort of partition them into these things that looked like they might be essential given certain groups of taxa, you know, certain groups of things that I think are apes and things that I think are humans. And that, that never worked. Um, <laughs> in some sense, you, we would, we would get a certain, it, with a cluster analysis, for example, you'd get clusters that kind of made sense. And there was definitely consistency across the board, but it didn't make sense in the fine details, right? You would get random weird apes that got included with humans, or you would get what would what we would think are humans stuck in the ape category. So it was kind of frustrating in that sense because... <laughs> You, you just, it just didn't work. Um, and so what do you do with that? Right. What, <laughs> what does it mean? And, and my, my judgment on this, my, my first draft of the paper that I actually sent in that I wrote in the fall when I finished it, it was December. And I wrote this, this sort of a cynical conclusion that this doesn't work and you're welcome to you're welcome to keep playing around with this but this is a failure and I'm not going to bother and while it was out for review with the editor I I really began to have second thoughts about the whole thing <laughs> mostly theologically because I just kept looking at the scripture and thinking we are essentially different. We are we are fundamentally totally different from the animal creation in in some important way. And even though that I look at my body and I can see there's clearly, you know, bones that are similar to bones of chimpanzees and I can see genes that are similar to genes of gorillas and so forth. At the end of the day there is there's clearly a mental gulf between us. We are not the same mentally and spiritually. And I, there's, there's clearly, a, uh, in my opinion, a pretty big gulf between us um, in terms of our bodies as well. It may not be always obvious and it may not be easy to identify, but it's there. And so I had this, I had this crisis and I kept thinking, all right, what am I going to do with this? Because the worst part about it was, I came up with this this idea driving home from a conference in the summer of 2022. Uh, yeah, last summer. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, this is going to be great. I'll do this. And it'll be really easy. It'll be easy. I can just knock this out in a couple of weeks and then I can move on to other things. This took forever. This took so much work to define these character sets and to test them out in a rigorous fashion. It consumed probably two solid months of work just full-time on this project. And I didn't want to waste that. <laughs> Although I was, I'm willing to waste that if, if I felt like it was deeply flawed. So on the one hand, I felt like there's something important that I'm doing here. And on the other hand, I felt theologically, mm, I'm definitely wrong in my conclusions. And what I came up with is... is sort of a distinction between sort of the simple, uh, the simplistic approach where you just say, I'm going to pick these characteristics because I've got a chimp 
skeleton and a human skeleton. I'm just going to pick characteristics that are different, and those are the essential differences. That's clearly not working. <laughs> and and even as I tried to do that well, it didn't really work. And the on the other hand, so that's the one approach, sort of a very discreet sort of discrete characters. I'm going to look at individual characteristics as the defining difference. And I said, maybe the reality is that we're not defined by specific characteristics, but we're defined by a whole host of characteristics that work together to make something that is fundamentally different. So that you can have pieces of the puzzle that look a lot like something that you would find in an ape. But when you put the package together, it's completely different. And that requires a totally different way of thinking about things and a totally different way of, of um, analyzing the actual data that you have. So that's, yeah, that's my story. That's my essentialism story. It, it, it wasn't what I, ex it wasn't the paper I expected <laughs> when <Yeah>. I sat <laughs> down to write it. And I think, and I think that um, that sort of last approach that you've you've just outlined there, this kind of whole systems type approach, um, that sort of fits with the way that we've been thinking in baromenology anyway about the importance of holism. Yeah, uh, looking at organisms as a whole and not not reducing them just to individual characteristics. And right, so, right, right. And yeah, then, so it kind of kind of makes sense. And then trying to use as many characteristics, you know. We, we still reduce them to characteristics, but we try to get a lot of those characteristics uh, to, we do. to look at Ideally, instead of yeah. just, you know, a small handful. Um, and we try yeah. to do it with a more sophisticated clustering approach than just saying, do you have this characteristic yeah. or not? So that's that's basically where I landed. Yeah. I'm still yeah. not fully happy with the paper, but I'm kind of happy with where I ended up, this notion of this this holistic system being where the, the the differences are found, where the essentialism would be found, rather than just in some individual piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Well, let's come then to the second of these papers that I want us to think about today. And that was a paper uh, that you presented uh, that was looking at ape baromins, mm. ape kinds. Yeah. Um, in the in the past, you know, creationists have often sort of talked about the ape kind right. as distinct right. from humankind. Right. Uh, but there's always been a you know a question in our minds: how many ape kinds are there? Uh, that surely there isn't just one ape kind, because there's a lot of diversity within uh, within the the apes. Correct. So that's basically what this other paper was tackling, isn't it? So. T tell us about that one, Todd. Yeah, and and you might be wondering why why would you include this in your human origins um, package? Right. <laughs> and and I would so that I would say so so the scientific side of this was we need to be able to define humanity well, right? And to do that, it would be really good if we could define apes well, also. If we could say, mm. well, this is clearly a member of the chimpanzee kind, or this is clearly a member of the orangutan kind or something like that, where we could, where we can have a really good handle on all of the members of this larger group of, of creatures. Uh, and so that was my, my scientific motivation. Then my, my, my other motivation was exactly as you said, we all go around talking about the ape kind. Oh, it's a member of the ape kind. But wait a minute, <laughs> who said there was one ape kind? I, I don't remember saying that. Right. And so and so that's what I set out to do. I sort of set out to try to figure out, all right, well, what do we know about the great apes and the lesser apes and all of the apes? And, and what can we discern uh, with regards to their created kinds? And it turns out, that's really hard. <laughs> I was <laughs> what a I, surprise. I I I kind of I guess I was kind of naive thinking this would be relatively relatively straightforward. I've had such consistency studying the human kind 
that I thought, all right, well, if I shift my focus over to chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, and so forth, it's going to be really consistent as well, and I'm going to come up with a really good answer. And that did not turn out to be the case. Um, it actually turned out to be stupendously complicated and much harder to discern things than I thought. So the paper was kind of a classic created kinds paper where we looked at a bunch of different evidence. We looked at genetic evidence. We looked at um, hybridization, good, the good old fashioned, if two species can hybridize, they belong to the same created kind. That, that good old chestnut, I use that as well. Uh, and then we used sort of the more fancy statistical stuff that people love. Um, and so in doing this, the hybridization gave us some information. We could, for example, uh, people might not know this, but there are more than there's more than one species of orangutan, and all of the orangutan species hybridize freely, so and produce fertile offspring for that matter. So that group was clearly put together into one at least part of a kind, right? And yeah, that happened across the board. We got a lot of low-level hybridization. Among the gibbons, the lesser apes, we found a lot of, of hybrids there as well. And when we looked at the genetic data, we could sort of put all of them together into a single group. So that was gratifying. Also, um, beyond that, though, not much hybridization. I was really interested to see if there had been ever been reported a chimpanzee gorilla hybrid. Mm. And I couldn't find any record of that. In fact, I found a whole paper that talked about how this is a legend that has never been confirmed. So that was kind of <laughs> nice that I could say, yeah, this has never been confirmed because here's this paper. But it was kind of a bummer because I really wanted to know, is it possible? Has anybody tried this? And I don't think anybody's going to ever try it. Um, and then of course, chimpanzees and orangutans, chimpanzees and, you know, gorillas and orangutans. What do you get there? We don't know. So yeah, I, not, not much there. Didn't get us very far in terms of sort of defining what the created kinds are other than to say orangutans look like part of a kind and gibbons look like part of a kind and chimps and bonobos are part of a kind and gorillas are part of a kind but it, do they connect together we don't know we but you've also got all the fossils of course so yes you, in the fossil record there's uh yeah loads of loads of other apes that we right. need to think about too right so that's the next that's where it got really sticky and messy and complicated because as you say there are a lot of fossil apes known beyond just um, the the gorilla, chimpanzee, and orangutan that we're familiar with. So we wanted to look at those. So we got these these this skeletal information uh, from the literature, and we tried to run some very simple cluster analyses on it to see if we could get some consistent results, to see if there were clear clusters and clear uh, consistency. And there was not. That's sort of the punchline to that story. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so the conclusion of our paper was we're not sure. We can say that there are certain groups that are probably parts of created kinds, but we're not sure exactly where the boundaries of the created kinds are. And the lack of consistency, the lack of clarity in the fossils, my suspicion, and this is just a, this is a guess at this point. Well, it's a little more than a guess. It's an educated guess. I've done this a long time, and I and I kind of I'm kind of familiar with what you see when you try different things. My guess is the the apes represent lots of different created kinds. There is not just one or two or three or four, but there's probably more than a dozen. Yeah, something like that. On the order of ten, something like that. So that when you include all of those things together and you're trying to create a cluster out of those, trying to, trying to identify clusters, 
the the program that recognizes clusters it doesn't really handle that very well because you've got a little bit from here and a little bit from that cluster and a little bit from that cluster and a little bit from that cluster and so there's no real pattern for it to to grab onto so the computer is looking for tightly clustered points that are distinct from everything else and what it's getting is one or two points and it's sort of scattered over a large territory and so my suspicion is what we have here is really just a lot of different created kinds that don't cluster very well <laughs> right so right. uh yeah. so that paper was really I think it was really good in the sense that we sort of got all of this out into the technical literature so that people could start thinking about non-human ape kinds. I think that was important, but it was not the slam dunk home run research project that I was hoping for. It did not give us a real yeah. clear idea of yeah. the sorts of kinds that we have in apes. So, how do you think we can go about resolving that? I mean, is it, is it just a case of having to wait for more fossils to be found or it, or was it the particular data sets that you were using? Are there other data sets out there that might be better? Um, you know, where, 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 where we could we next? go from here with this? Right. Yeah. Yes. All of those things. <laughs> I think we need okay. more fossils. I think we need more data. I think we need to think carefully about what fossils resemble each other and what things go together and i think this is a this is another point that i think is really important when you look at mammal diversity uh across all mammals so thousand couple thousand species of mammals somewhere around four thousand species of mammals and most of the diversity is between different created kinds of mammals. Turns out that there's very few mammal kinds that have a lot of species. Most mammal kinds don't have very many species at all. And because of that, we're going back to our computer clustering program again, those aren't going to be found by that method because there's not a lot of species to work with. So I think there may be some methodological changes that are necessary to sort of pick out these guys that, you know, they don't really belong to any known created kind, but they're not really, they're, they're sort of their own kind. And they never really got diverse, so there's not a lot of diversity within the group to sample to find a cluster of, because there isn't a cluster, it's just one or two. Yeah. yeah, that's going to be, that's a methodological problem that we're going to have to figure out. And that seems to be the case, you know, when I look across mammals, that is most mammal groups. Most mammal groups are very, you know, very few species and they're just, they're quite distinct from other mammals. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. So your clustering methods might work with a group like bats or rodents where you've got loads and loads of species. Sure. But if you've got a group that's maybe only, you know, one or two species or a, you know, a relative handful of spe species right. in the group, then that's going to be, that's going to be harder. Yeah. That's not going to quite work. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Um, now I've, I've kind of left the, 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 the biggest one to last or perhaps one of the most interesting papers I think to last. And, and that's the work that you presented on, uh, Hominin barominology reconsidered with postcranial characters. Yeah. So you're looking at the postcranial skeleton of hominin fossils. And you told me that this took you three years to, to finish this piece of work. Yes. So uh, so tell us about that. I mean, what, what on earth do you mean for a start by postcranial skeleton? There are going to be listeners and viewers. Yeah. You're going to need to explain that, Todd. Right. So postcranial, how do you define that? So anatomically, then you have, it, at least in anthropology, we, we talk about craniodental, which is the teeth and the head. And everything after that is the postcranium. So 
your neck down <laughs> to your toes. That's your postcranium. And typically, when you look at, for example, human evolution research, everybody is working mostly with craniodental characteristics. Teeth are quite hard and they preserve quite well. And so there's all sorts of really interesting information in all the bumps and grooves on your teeth, which is nice. So you can get a lot of information from a very small, durable piece of the skeleton. Well, you can get a lot of pieces of data. Let's call it that. I don't know it's information, but it's pieces of data. Um, and then, of course, skulls. Everybody loves a skull. Uh, skulls get you on the cover of fancy science magazines, get you in the news, um, whereas skeletons tend to be less exciting. Especially if you don't have a skull. If all you have is a you know, partial skeleton, that might not get you on the news, right? We love skulls. So there's this bias towards skulls. And then you have some, and this is, this is a problem, where you have skulls, but no skeleton. Or you have skulls with a very sparse bits of skeleton. Or you have skulls where you can't tell what skeleton goes with the skull. So that's that's the situation. So that leads to this bias of let's just let's just talk about skulls. And in my work, I've for the for for 20 years, not 20 years, 10 years, I largely just took the information that evolutionary biologists had produced and I used that to do my own analysis using various clustering methods. And, and I found this remarkable consistency. You know, we always had this group of, of fossil forms in the human category and other groups would be outside. And the other groups might, you know, they might be together and they might be apart. It sort of depended on what group you were looking at. But for the most part, the human group was well-defined and robust and you kept finding it over and over again. Now, there was a problem with that, of course, and that is that creationists in the 90s, when creationist uh, Marvin Lubinow um, wrote his, his, what I consider to be a seminal work, um, Bones of Contention, he emphasized the form of the body. That you can tell the difference between humans and non-humans because there's a very different body form, body plan, in the non-human category. So, yeah, right, so 10 years I'm doing all this work and I'm not looking at the rest of the body. Well, that's not quite true. I, I tried it. I tried it at the 2013 ICC and it didn't really work. Um, so, and it was because my sample size was too small. It, it just wasn't enough. There weren't enough, uh, there weren't enough different forms of fossils in the in the in the analysis to produce any sort of meaningful cluster so i knew this was a problem i knew this was this was a problem that nagged at me and i knew i needed to do something about it but i was unsure because like i said in in the human evolution world no one was looking at skeletons no one was putting together big surveys of skeletal characteristics and so i knew if i did this i'd have to do it myself hmm. well <laughs> i was not i was not <laughs> excited about that i'm not i i'm not <laughs> trained in the ways of anatomy right i do not have that background to be able to say definitively this is this detail of anatomy and and be confident in my assessment. And I guess access to specimens is a, is an issue too, because that was when we're dealing with hominins, yeah. you know, there there are there are very rare specimens, mm -hmm. and they're not easily accessible by the likes of you and me. <laughs> yes, they're not easily accessible. Some of them are not easily acceptable by the likes of professional paleontologists. It's really right. an interesting. Yeah 
situation where you have um, paleontologists out there who make these discoveries and put them in these museums in their native countries, right? So Kenya has a really great museum with their with all of their important specimens, and Tanzania has a museum with their important specimens. Ethiopia has a museum with their important specimens. But when you want to apply to look at those specimens, they're kind of going to defer. Or they're going to consult with, let's put it that way, the discoverers and say, do you want so-and-so to look at your fossils? <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes the answer is sure. And sometimes the answer is no, I don't want that guy. And so, yeah, you imagine creationists applying, you're going to get the same kind of bum rush and people are not going to want, not going to want you to look at them. So, so yeah, so those were the, those were kind of the, this, this multi-layer of problem here. I knew, I knew we needed to do this. I didn't feel I knew enough about the subject to be able to do it justice. And I didn't know how to get these specimens and how to get access to stuff. And so it sort of left me paralyzed uh, with indecision. What do I do? What do I do? Um, and then there was just this small series of breakthroughs um, that started to change things. Um, one is there's been a big emphasis in the past decade on data sharing, on st stop basically stop being stingy <laughs> and make your fossils available to people to look at. And part of that then has resulted in efforts to scan fossils with really high resolution 3D scans of fossils and put them out there for people to use. So there's a whole website now called Morphosource where you can go and you can look at really high resolution three-dimensional scans of fossils which was not a thing, you know, more than 10 years ago. Uh, well, 13 years ago now. Um, so that was kind of a big development. And then I began looking around even more, more um, deliberately. And f I started to just persistently and diligently use Google uh, to try to find more scans. Because I thought, Maybe they're, maybe people are making scans and putting them into their own private websites, or maybe they're putting them into um, institutional data websites where, where say the University of um, Virginia has a website where faculty can just deposit information. I thought maybe, maybe, maybe there are things out there that are, that are scanned and, and available if you just knew where to find them. And so the sort of the big breakthrough, I think, came when I when I realized there were there were Neanderthal bones available. And I basically after several weeks of work, I was able to piece together a, a partial Neanderthal skeleton. And I say partial in the sense that I have representatives of pretty much all the elements. I have shoulder blade. I have a you know, collarbone, I have backbone, I have ribs, full set of ribs, full set of backbone. Um, I have the thigh bone, the tibia, bones of the feet, bones of the hands, and so forth. I don't have all of them. I don't have all 206 bones, but I have representatives of most of the elements. And at that point, I thought, huh, I wonder. <laughs> I wonder if this could work. And so I started, yeah, I started just diligently doing that and it was kind of insane because who would think google would be your friend in that regard but apparently yeah apparently people are making these scans available and if you know where to look and you know how to you know you know you're persistent and diligent you you'll find them and so uh i was able to come up with this set of skeletons um some of which we 3d printed and some of which we just used as scans and um, I thought, all right, well, maybe the time is right for us to rethink about, to think more carefully about the skeletal questions and how we put those together. Mm. Mm. So that was one break. That's great. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, no, go 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 on. What was this? What was the other breakthrough? Yeah, the other breakthrough was um, I I was thinking about the Hobbit skeleton. You might listeners might not remember this, but there was this really diminutive skeleton found in a cave in in Flores in Indonesia a number of years ago, and they called it the Hobbit because it was about three foot tall. Uh, and it was in the middle of the Lord of the Rings movie, so it was very popular. So the Hobbit was an obvious uh, obvious word to use. Um, and there had long been this big debate over whether this thing was a unique hominin species or whether it was just sort of some strange pathology of normal human beings. And I had a great interest in this because I thought, hey, my work on clustering, I don't care whether it's, whether it's, uh, you know, a species or not a species, it doesn't really matter. All I care about is the, is the form of the skull and whether, whether it groups together with other human skulls. And it didn't, it kept not doing that. And, and I felt like, you know, looking at the skeleton, this is clearly human. And so I felt like, this, this is obviously human. Why is it not clustering? And so I was kind of annoyed with that. And I was looking at some of the, the characteristics. So I mentioned those, those craniodental characters, the 391 skull and tooth characters. And I was looking at, just happened to be looking at those characters one day and realized the cranial capacity, the size of the skull, which had been published for um, The Hobbit, was not listed in my in my spreadsheet. And I thought, well, that's weird. I can, I can look that up real quick and add it. And then I started to wonder, well, I wonder how many of these other characteristics I could look up real quick and add just based on the published photographs <laughs> and, and descriptions and measurements that are out there that are accessible now. And I turned out to triple the, that little effort tripled the number of characteristics known for um, the Hobbit. And that was just, wow. that was just the skull. And that gave me the boldness to think, yeah, I could, I could probably work through the skeleton. <laughs> this isn't as hard as I thought it would be. It's difficult. It's difficult to work with the jargon of a, of a field that you're not familiar with. And you have to do a lot of reading and a lot of studying to make sure that you're seeing things correctly. But yeah, I thought if I can do this with, the Hobbit, I can do this with skeletons. So that was my, those were my breakthroughs. That was where I, that was when yeah. I decided, okay, it's time. And that was, that was 2020, 2019, 2020, when I was looking at the Hobbit. And so then in 2020 is when I started seriously looking at the skeleton. And I also had a student at the time who just sort of showed up on my doorstep and said, please help me. I want to study human fossils. So I said, oh, well, okay, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> I got a project for you. Good luck. Baptism yeah. by fire. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so basically you assembled this data set yeah. of postcranial characters. Right. Um, that you could then, presumably, you can rerun your baromenology analyses. Right. Um incorporating all of these additional characters right that's exactly what happened. so yeah now before we come on to sort of talk about that in a bit more detail let, <clears throat> let let's just revisit what you'd originally done because back in 2010 you published your first paper on uh, hominin baromenology and the big takeaway of that from that is that you can separate out humans. There is a very distinct, consistent yep. group of humans that that show that is separate from the non-humans. And you know that that you can show that consistently uh, with different data sets and different combinations of characters and so on. However, however, the gorilla in the room that we need to talk about is that Actually, a lot of that got lost uh, because there was this controversy about Australopithecus sediba. Now, this was a newly discovered uh, Australopithecine that was included in your 2010 analysis. And 
what happened when you ran you know your cluster analysis <laughs> it's it it stubbornly landed square right in the middle of the humans constantly right i tried right. different combinations of taxa i tried different combinations of characteristics it wouldn't budge it was clearly in the group with the humans and not in the group right. with the apes and let's say that was an unpalatable conclusion <laughs> uh, for some people <clears throat> so uh because the other members of that human group they're basically members of the genus homo right but there was this thing that was apparently an australopithecine that was clustering with the humans right uh and that attracted a lot of attention so it did bring us up to date then with this new paper because you've now got this expanded data set with postcranial material which you did not have in 2010 right and you you're basically rerunning this analysis what did you find with this new study that you've just presented at the ICC? Yeah, that was kind of the, that was one, obviously one of these other motivations. I wanted to give a better test to Sadiba because as you say, it was unpopular and unpopular to the extent that it's basically ignored. <laughs> you read other people writing about human fossils Sadiba is obviously an ape. They don't even they don't even talk about me. They they just completely ignore me. Um, and frankly, I've never had anybody, even among my friends and colleagues, who've who've jumped up and said, "Yeah, this is clearly human." Um, I think everybody has just sort of looked at that result and gone, "Huh? Well, hmm. that's <laughs> interesting." <laughs> um. And and frankly, I'm right there with you. I, I've you know I've, I've wondered about this myself. It, it there's there I think good reasons to be skeptical. So, but I stuck to my guns, and it helped that sort of the 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 argument was basically it's obviously not human, which I don't know how to measure obviously as a scientist. So how do what do how do we go forward with this? So clearly the for the path forward was the skeleton, and so that was that was something that I was keenly interested in looking at um, what happens to Sadiba. And the answer turns out to be complicated, annoyingly complicated. I wanted this to be super definitive so I could just say, okay, we're done with Sadiba. Now we have a good answer and it's not human and everybody can be happy with that and we're done. But of course, the world is more complicated than that. So what I found. So remember, looking at the skull, it clusters and robustly and deliberately and consistently with other with with human beings. Looking at the skeleton, it clusters just the skeleton, just below the neck. It clusters consistently. Well, not consistently. It doesn't cluster consistently. Sometimes it clusters by itself with nothing else. And sometimes it's clustered with Australopithecus africanus, depending on how you measure things, depending on the settings of your cluster analysis and so forth, you can get slightly different results, but it never clustered with Homo. It did not cluster with what most creationists would say are humans. So that seems definitive, right? Wait a minute. <laughs> You actually have two different testimonies there. You've got the testimony of the head, which says it's human, and the testimony of the body, which says it's not human. So how do we resolve this? Well, we put them together. So we also did this total, total analysis of all the characters together. And that one put Sidiba back in with the humans. <laughs> and honestly... I thought going in, you know, I looked at the actual, not the number of characteristics, but the actual number that were known for Sediba, right? There are 50% more skeletal characteristics known for Sediba 
than there are skull characteristics. There's about 120 skull characteristics that are that are that have been sampled and recorded, and there's about 180 that have been sampled and recorded for the skeleton. So I thought, okay, well, that's going to bias this in favor of the skeleton, the postcranial, and it's going to put Sediba outside of the human group, which is going to be definitive, and I'm going to accept that and move on with my life. Instead, it put it back in the human group. <laughs> so now I'm left going, I don't, I don't know what this means. Ah, I've got these right. conflicting conflicting um, results, and I'm not sure. But otherwise, beside all that, the postcranial uh, characteristics, all of that work that I did over three years, looking at skeletons, and looking at samples and specimens and so forth, all of that sort of came back with a pretty consistent answer with what we'd seen before. The genus, the, the genus Homo, the thing that we think of as Homo, that is human and things outside of that are not human. Um, so Neanderthals, Homo erectus, the Hobbit, well, the Hobbit was a little odd again. I don't know why. Um, but otherwise, uh, those, those, what is in Homo is human, and what is not in Homo is probably not human. And that's where we left it. Um, yeah. It's, it's still, I, I so wanted yeah. to resolve this Sediba thing. And yeah. now I've just got more complications. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, isn't it always a way? Yeah. But the big, pic the big picture is that we still consistently... Um, with different types of data sets, uh, we are still consistently finding this clear yeah. distinction between yeah. humans and non-humans. Yeah. And that's really encouraging. That's, yeah. that's exactly what our model would predict. And that's what we find. Yeah. Um, and it's particularly interesting to me because in many cases, of course, the, the kind, the, the baromin, you know, uh, is around the family level, but here in humans, it's actually at the subfamily level. It's with it's within the family, right? Uh, and yet we're finding this clear sort of distinction between the humans and the non-humans. So I think we should all be very encouraged by that. Yeah. But we've got these these oddities, you know, the Hobbit that kind of is a bit weird, and what on earth do we do with Sediba? Right. And it raises all kinds of questions. You know, is there something very strange about the Sediba skull, perhaps, that is causing it to cluster in the wrong place? I, right. Yeah, all kinds of interesting interesting questions and if sadiba is a member of the human uh, created kind then that also raises some really interesting questions too so yeah yeah lots and lots to think about uh todd we 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 getting to the end of this episode and yep. we we kind of need to wind it up because we're we're running out of time but uh i suppose we should just end by saying uh, what this really uh, tells us i think is that there's still such a lot to do yeah uh you know we the first human baromenology study was published in 2010. Uh, there's been quite a lot published since then, but there are still all of these really interesting questions and unanswered uh, problems. And so there's a huge amount to do. So if you are a young student out there and you're thinking this is a subject that really interests me and you, you're looking for something to do, there are ways that you can be involved. Um, so do contact us and, and let us know about that. Okay, well, that's it for this time. Um, that's been fascinating. Um, thank you to my very special guest, Dr. <laughs> Tom Wood. <laughs> and uh, we'll both see you next time in a, in a couple of weeks. Bye for now. See you later. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Creation. For more information, visit us at letstalkcreation.org, where you'll find an archive of past episodes in all our show notes. If you'd like to leave a comment or make a suggestion, you can find us on all the major social media platforms. Let's Talk Creation is brought to you in the U.S. by Core Academy of Science and in the U.K. by Biblical Creation Trust. As a listener-supported ministry, we are grateful for all of your financial support. Find out how you can make a contribution at our website, letstalkcreation.org. Also remember to like, subscribe, and share this episode with your friends. Thanks, and see you next time.